Uh, we can go on, a, if you don't mind, another few minutes just to keep the conversation with you going. But Mary, there are far too many things for you to deal with there. But I mean, instinctively respond to that which you will, and then we'll get the audience to come in for some more questions. Okay. I, I'm actually going to be brief because I'm sure there are wonderful questions and comments from the audience as well. And uh, they've been very rich contributions. Um, if I could maybe uh, link what Namita was saying and the uh, more recent uh, uh, contribution, because they're both talking about an India that's on the move. I was in Delhi for the Sustainable Summit at the beginning of February, and I absolutely sense this, and it's really very positive. And it brings home, in fact, something. We're not only changing the narrative, but we're actually... The, the new climate economy is emerging faster than we think, and that is good news, and it's, there are lots of issues to do with it. But I'm very struck by uh, one of the... Uh, if you like, responsibilities that I now have in my role as a uh, special envoy of the Secretary General. When we had discussion uh, the other day with, with the Secretary General's climate team, he wants to further South-South collaboration much more, and particularly on cities, energies, land. And I think there is real room for South-South collaboration. I think, the, and I think it would be uh, of a great assistance to African countries, because I think, in a way, um, India is a little bit more on the move. I also think we need more innovation mm. in developing countries, or rather recognize how much innovation there is. And the simplest way to think about that is the mobile phone. Mm. Once the mobile phone became a very effective tool, it's used in far more innovative ways that now the developed world is learning about. Um, you know, how to transfer money, how to look up markets, like, you know, all of these things. And so um, that was one of the things that I was thinking. I have to say, um, Navita, that I was really struck when you talked about your bank mobilizing communities post-banking hours. Wow. <laughs> That's not the profile of banks <laughs> that, that we're used to. Maybe we can learn something sure. from, from that. Um, I have admired and indeed um, drawn on the work of ODI on the extent to which government subsidizes what's harming us. Um, I do think we need to you know, um, uh, recognize that the role of government is vital, as you said, and governments should not be harming us further by subsidizing what is um, causing the problem. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, uh, um, and, and, and I think it's good to bring out the role and responsibility um, of government. I actually think I'll stop there because I'm sure there'll be some very rich um, interventions and okay, uh, so I'm, I'm almost dizzy with some of the ideas so that have come. Angle, there's yes. so many. Yes. There's one right there but, uh, and, and two there. So let me get two new ones there. And then Sam wanted to come in in the previous session and we missed him. So introduce yourself and Hi. ask the question. My name is Long Seng Tao. I'm from University College London. Um, so I really enjoyed this debate about uh, state and non-state actors um, and how to mobilize them for climate finance uh, under a wider framework of climate justice. My question is about places where governments and investors have a closer relationship than perhaps we're used to um, in the West. And I'm, I'm looking at, for example, state-owned enterprises, um, state banks in China, perhaps uh, historically the developmental states like Japan, um, and any number of countries where uh, there's a very strong discussion between elites from government and non-government actors. So really how can we mobilize them? Really good. Okay. Over there. Hi there, uh, Sepi Golzari from Save the Children. Um, I, I think it was really great that, um, that Sheila highlighted the, the tensions between, between government and business. Um, I think it's incredibly important because we are obviously in a race to take action, but, um, but we can see examples where actually new entrants are left out of the market and actually the, those powerful companies who are already monopolizing certain industries are moving in and starting to monopolize the, the energy industry. And I guess if we're thinking about um, inequalities in society and actually 
inclusive as well as sustainable growth, we really do need to think about how to get small and medium-sized businesses involved. And I, I think that's not just abroad, but in the UK. I mean, for example, if you look at the smart meter rollout in the UK, the big six energy companies seem to have convinced the UK government to spend £13 billion on new infrastructure simply to transfer energy data um, and, you know, on the pretext that actually, oh, it's incredibly sensitive and it needs an entire new infrastructure all to itself, but thereby actually uh, not providing open data and closing the door to entrepreneurs who can actually give consumers a better deal. So how are we going to ensure that, both in the developed world and developing world? And sorry, just one last point. Um, in one thing that I think is missing is the public participation here. We've had really great discussion about everything else, but actually I, at Save the Children we've been doing something called a localism pilot where we're trying to get local communities involved in campaigning on issues. And actually the devolution agenda, and this is something I'm really excited about here in the UK, the devolution agenda is potentially a way of really tangibly connecting the public to decision makers and actually making a difference in their communities. So that's something that we do need to go for and empowering cities in that respect would be fantastic. Got it. Sam, I had you waiting for the previous session, so I'm bring you in now. Yes, um, thank you very much. My name is Sam Bickersteth from CDK. And, is that working? Um, yeah, we're, we're, the, this, the title of this event was Climate Action um, for Paris, wasn't it? And INDCs is, is one of the principal mechanisms to try and drive ambition in Paris. So I'd like to bring us back to the short term a little bit um, because there's lots of fantastic ideas here. How in, in getting non-stake actors to raise the ambition can we find opportunities to do that in, in the very short number of months we have before INDCs are submitted? CDKN is supporting a number of national level processes together with um, of other European and other governments from around the world to make them a decent, inclusive process. But I'd love to hear from the panel and others how best they can bring these, you know, these exciting examples from, from India into and elsewhere into play here. Can cities really raise the ambition or should they be focusing on when the eyes dropped, when it becomes a nationally determined contribution and the implementation? But if they don't get there now, we're going to be locked into something which won't necessarily be right. ambitious as we want. Really strong point. Can I take... Uh, and yes, a new question. I know you've, there are a couple of asked before. I'd just like to get a new questioner in, in this round. Peter. Hi, my name's Peter West, and um, I have several hats. Um, I'm here as a trustee of Renewable World, which is a charity that uh, alleviates poverty through renewable projects in emerging markets. Um, I'm also an ex-banker and an investor in projects, so I really do have several hats. But I'm curious to know what we could do to support new supply chains. Renew Renewable World is uh, active in Nepal, um, supporting um, solar projects and hydro ram pumps. And uh, what they've done is they've brought technology from the Philippines into Nepal. So that one thing, one question is how to encourage technology transfers between countries. The second question, which is a challenge that we are beginning to face, is how to create a supply chain within the country, particularly where it's a new industry. And in the case of Renewable World, we're talking about a, a supply <coughs> chain for ram pumps. Um, because at the moment there isn't sufficient chain available. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to take a risk here that each member of the panel has landed on something that they would particularly like to address, bearing in mind that all of these things are interesting. Um, but maybe I should just begin with Sheila, because you actually you did get addressed <laughs> directly. Um, and perhaps you could also pick up Sam's point as well that we, we have an opportunity, I think others will have a view too, but we have an opportunity right now to do something to contribute to the formation of these policy plans, which by no means are perfect solutions, but if we don't make a contribution, they'll be less good. Is that the basic proposition? Sheila. Okay, um, I'll try to be quick because there's actually a lot of really interesting questions I haven't raised. I guess very quickly because it's sort of something I'm particularly interested in is this role of state-owned enterprise and state-owned financial institutions. I mean, we have the Green Investment Bank that's been yeah. set up in the UK. And as you see that from this government support, we highlighted quite a lot of support that comes from state-owned enterprise in fossil fuel exploration. <laughs> and I think we often think of state-owned enterprise, well, particularly in countries like the UK, as sort of bulky and inefficient, but we don't like to think about the fact that Norway's 
you know, oil and gas company state owned and, and its utility is state owned. There are, you know, very efficient state owned enterprise. And I think we really have to think a bit more honestly about the role that those types of entities can play and should play in this transition, given how much we have to change and how, you know, it could be quite useful to, to leverage off of these public financial institutions and public enterprises to, to do some of that. Um, and it'd be interesting to talk further about that. Um, just going across, I guess, in terms of Sam's point, I guess a couple points, I think, uh, at least from the work that we're doing on fossil fuel subsidy reform, uh, there has been some work done um, on looking at the kind of emission reduction potential of subsidy reform. I think it's quite tricky because often these higher level tools create kind of bigger transformations and price shifts, but they're less easy to measure down to the ton by ton, but they could be part of kind of broader objectives around kind of energy sector reform and transformation and, and pathways to carbon pricing. And some work has been done by the Glo Global Subsidies Initiative on that in the context of INDCs. So if anyone's interested in learning more about the links between subsidy reform and INDCs, um, GSI is doing a lot of work on that. I think also it's a kind of question now of really focusing on what's in that draft text and figuring out it, as it, you know groups of private actors working together or groups of cities working together, you know, what has to be in there and really focusing on not new text or new initiatives, but more choosing of the text that's there, what is a priority to get in, and really pushing governments to include what we think is the most ambitious text. Because we're not going to get anywhere other than that. It's just a question of really making sure the most ambitious language and the word fossil fuels is in there. Um, <laughs> then lastly, I just wanted to talk to Seppi's point. Um, uh, I think. This is a, you know, these are, these are really important points, and I think actually this role of smaller actors, particularly in the UK, is, is really critical. There's a new um, company that was launched this week called Tempest Energy, which is actually taking um, the UK government to court in the EU um, because of what's happening um, in terms of the um, capacity markets in the UK. So I'll just quickly say that basically the way that these markets are set up is to try to encourage renewable energy, but obviously you need backup. And at the moment, the UK is providing, I think, and I'm probably going to get this wrong, 15-year contracts for fossil fuel backup and one-year contracts for demand-side management, which means that anyone who's working on efficiency and demand-side management in terms of kind of supporting renewables is at a complete disadvantage to fossil fuels. And these are small companies which are fighting through legal channels to try to get access to this space. But when the rules of the game are being established now in a way that completely favors the incumbents, it's, it's a huge challenge. And if that's happening here, it's only going to happen in a more difficult way in other parts of the world. And, and, it's, and it's a fairness issue. It's a kind of economic fairness issue that needs to be addressed. And we do have rules for that, but they often may need to be used by somebody with a bit of courage and a bit of resource. Um, just as a, an aside on the state and enterprise point, uh, that's also a question of power, not always benignly used very difficult to get data and information out of state-owned oil companies, for example. Um, on the other hand, if you can access that power for the purposes of making the transition, it makes it simpler if it's, if it's large and monolithic and wants to do the things you want to do. So this is, it's not straightforward. Uh, I do think there is something interesting in these development banks that have public goods as their objective. And uh, we're seeing it with this Green Investment Bank movement, but we also have existing institutions like BNDS in Brazil and one or two others who have great capacity to help with the intermediation that we've been talking about. Um, Ian, is there something that particularly jumps out from those questions that, that you would like? I, th I would like perhaps for you to say something about the financing of these uh, supply chains, these new ways of delivering technology, but perhaps there's something else yeah, to pick up from those questions. Let me start with that, but just a few brief points. I think. Um, to your question, Peter, it's it's kind of a question of confidence. So if the government sets ambitious targets for renewable energy deployment and is proven as a reliable regulator, the private sector is more likely to see the attractiveness of the opportunity to provide the, the supply chains and to come in with the investment before the market's really created. The government can also make sure that the infrastructure is there, roads, telecoms, to facilitate commerce, if you like. Um, and then thirdly, on the finance side, if the financial uh, markets can be given assurance that the mechanisms are in place to um, 
to aggregate small packages of loans up to larger portfolios because the financial regulations are in place, then you can start to catalyze demand, which then gives even more confidence to the investors in the supply chains. It, it's complicated, but those would be three points. Just very briefly on the very first question, um, this is also a massive topic, but I'm particularly encouraged by the way that uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, and China have picked up on the public-private partnerships and the privatization lessons from Europe and North America. China's a great example with the uh, public-private partnerships around water and waste. The um, Philippines and uh, Thailand have been quite successful in privatizing their water industries. Issues about um, charging for consumers, but um, there's some great lessons to be run learned there. And then thirdly, on flood risk, I think there's some interesting models emerging from um, UK around uh, providing a flood insurance of last resort and also certain states in the US which we can learn as we're trying to adapt to climate change. And then finally on the, on the question of, of, um, of opportunities for small companies, I think the UK is going through um, a real soul searching at the moment as you point out around the big six and what's working quite well is regulation to mandate um, a much higher percentage of power being traded on uh, transparent markets, on open markets, which effectively will break up vertical uh, monopolies within the power distribution space. So that's already been welcomed by SMEs within the, the UK energy industry as a way of giving them a business opportunity through transparent pricing. Amita, you wanted to respond uh, particularly to Seppi's point about how you organize uh, participation. Yes, so I, I really wanted to take uh, the question of linking the communities and also uh, uh, you know, the linkage between the short term, I mean, you know, the short term where we are looking at INDCs and the impact that such policy uh, frameworks would have on industry. So just an India perspective, if I may, uh, if I may add one here. So one is, like I mentioned, through uh, the bank, we engage a lot with communities and we worked with Save the Children in India to, you know, mobilize and look at issues about midday meals, for example, and, you know, around hygiene, for example. And we need many of such platforms. However, I think, you know, one needs to understand that at the end of the day, it's business as usual for non-state state actors. So take the example of the SME sector. They contribute 45% to the overall manufacturing sector. Thus, they are, uh, you know, emitting, they are, um, you know, their production is on. Now, they are grappling with pain points like lack of finance, access to technology, skills, one-person dependent kind of operations, management systems to measure or monitor, and the inability to go to scale. Now, for yeah. them, deciphering sustainable development or INDCs become very important. That's where the intermediary's role or we believe we are sustainability catalysts. The role becomes very important. So, you know, how, where Mary was present at the DSDS, the Delhi Sustainable Development uh, Platform, these are platforms where we get everybody in, but these are all the ones who are converted, if yeah. I may yeah. if I may say. Yeah. So, how do you actually reach out to those who are non-converted and make this an important agenda for them yeah. is more important because otherwise, at the end of the day, I'm just running with my operations yeah. and how to get my finance or how to get my production involved. So, you know, I think Arunava's uh, organization is doing a great job mobilizing people. We have many such other bodies like the TCG or We Mean Business. Along yeah. with them, we are working to mobilize communities. And when, we, when I say communities, I mean yeah, SME, for likely. example. Yeah, yeah. So I think these are certain things that we really need to ramp up yeah. when we look at making, connecting those dots, I would say. And I'll have a word to say about that before the end too, and something we'll discuss in the afternoon session. But Yakov, why, yeah. why don't you conclude? Yeah, just just, just yeah. quickly, uh, lo uh, long saying, I mean, I think, you know, mobilizing non-state actors is, is always going to be a challenge. And, and I'm taking it back, you know, to, to the uh, context of Africa. And there I'm, I'm looking at, for example, you know, th there is a huge, uh, uh, you know, call it business, there is a business community that is in the making, if you will who can actually make some serious contributions. The problem I see is uh, y y y this space is not actually available for that type of uh, you know, uh, a business community. There's a sense that somehow the, the type of entrepreneurs you know, that are occupying that space at the moment are you know, they're accused of being rent seekers. But nonetheless, I think part of it is just the fact that the, the, the policy platform itself doesn't lend itself um, uh, into uh, for them to explore their uh, business models, so I think there is that space. But at the moment, you know, that's not quite uh, uh, quite there. But 
the, the issue about public participation for me is quite, uh, uh, quite critical. I followed the, the Scottish, uh, the devolution, the um, independence uh, discussions. And what I found, you know, really, I was just plugged onto that because it was just, for the first time I'm seeing real part, you know, public participation, particularly by young, uh, with the young people, you know, getting involved. So I think the more of that, the, uh, the better. My own daughter, who's 15, was also, you know, uh, locked into that. So they, the young are looking for avenues, you know, where they can express their, uh, their concerns, their, their aspirations about the future and what have you. I, I don't really know, but I think, you know, that demonstrated to us that there is a, a real lack of, you know, space for, for public uh, participation. Can I just, one more thing? Yeah, a quick one to, uh, to Sam. I think you've nailed something quite important there, Sam, that, uh, you know, this is, to me, this is where maybe a, a new form of alliance needs to be built, you know, particularly between civil society and, and businesses. I, you know, how, of course, I mean, CDKN has, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of organizational structure to be able to do that. But I feel that unless, you know, that there is a, a, a third voice, if you will, going into the negotiations, particularly coming from, uh, uh, from Africa to, to support the, the, the negotiators, you know, we may be uh, seeing some uh, difficult negotiations ahead. So I think, you know, a, a critical support that, sup that brings, you know, businesses and civil society that are, you know, behind uh, government negotiators would be, would be uh, something I would suggest. Sounds like a very good mission to have, but we've got to move fast, right, Sam? So, Mayor... Mary, and then I'm sorry there are other people who want to ask questions, but we are going to go and have some lunch and be here so people can carry on asking questions afterwards, but I will draw to a conclusion after Mary. All right. I just wanted, in fact, to remind us that there are two big agendas in 2015, and they're very interlinked. And uh, I wanted to address also the issue of participation, which has come up a lot in our responses. In fact, there's also a question of timing. Um, the climate agreement, which we hope we will get, and I think we will get in Paris, comes into full effect in 2020. The Sustainable Development Goals agenda comes into effect on the 1st of January 2016. And therefore, it's the one that will be relevant to a lot of the issues that have been, that have been raised. And 12 of the 17 goals are relevant to climate climate and development. And there's a lovely provision in uh, Goal 13b, which I hope will survive the convoluted intergovernmental <laughs> process. Um, 13b, to me, is very climate justice, and I'll just read it. It's yeah. not very user-friendly to read, but it's, if you think about it, it's very climate justice. 13b says, promote mechanisms for raising capacity for effective climate change-related planning and management in least developed countries, including focusing on women, youth, and local and marginalized communities. That's not bad if we can keep that in yes. and actually gather quite a lot of the energies um, on participation around that. Um, and I think it's important, of course, there will be the track two of the climate work, which is pre-2020. And somehow we've got to link the pre-2020 pre track tr two climate work with the implementation of the climate-related sustainable development goals of which there yeah, they really are very important. And, um, you know, at the international level, we tend too much to work in silos. Um, and I remember, at a, I'd finish on this, James, um, uh, at a conference which my foundation organized with the Irish government on hunger, nutrition, climate justice, when, I, when Ireland had the presidency of the EU, we had a very good linking, linking because we had uh, EU commissioners and ministers from other European countries, Irish government and other um, business and other participants. But of the 300 who came, 100 were from frontline communities all over the world who were the experts on how to deal with mitigation and adaptation to climate. And at, at, one, at, at one point, uh, at least several times in the panels, uh, people talked about, you know, we've got to think outside the box. Yeah. And eventually a woman stood up from the floor and she said, look, why are you all talking about thinking outside the box? In my community, we don't think in boxes. <laughs> and, and, you know, we do think in boxes too much. Yeah. We're going to have to integrate these yeah. boxes to do well. Okay. Oh, that's lovely. I don't like being in a box either. Um, thank you all very much for participating in this discussion. Uh, there is more to talk about. Uh, we, we will be carrying on in an afternoon session of a smaller, a smaller group. I invite people to 
to, to, to contribute to that discussion too. But one of the things I would like to show off, partly because I believe it helps pull together many of these non-state actor initiatives and many of the possibilities for organizing the assembly of sufficient power to make this transformation, uh, is a project that I have introduced Mary to and others uh, based at Yale to try and try and think through how we might uh, self-organize effectively around these negotiations. Um, thanks to Mary's intervention, it's now the We the People's Declaration, but it's a, it's a way of, of organizing behavior towards a common goal, uh, but it's also a way of recognizing that if we're going to do something with these many non-state actor contributions, they have to be meaningful in themselves, they have to be implemented without reference to anybody else. So you only write down what you can do. You don't ask someone else to do it for you. It has to build a peer group of influence so that, again, you don't ask someone else to do what you can do yourself, but you look to your peer group, you, you know, if you're a bank or if you're, a, if you're a, in, in a particular sector or you're a city, you've got something to compare your performance against with others. But crucially, you don't do it to undermine the intergovernmental process or to stand in the way of effective regulation um, of critical public goods in, in your national economy. So I, I would like to carry on this discussion in the context of how you best deliver an outcome that is meaningful given the nature of the problem that we face, which is vast, hugely distributed, where we have so much to do in so little period of time we need to galvanize as much of real world power as we possibly can and directed at solving this problem in many, many forms without depending upon any particular holder of power to do it for us. So I think you've had here and online really good ideas to work with, some very interesting combinations of resources, and hopefully a sense of possibility that despite the scale of the problem, there are things that we can do now that might make a difference soon enough to encourage all the other actions that we know we need to happen uh, in the longer term. So thank you once again, Mary. Thank you here and online. Thank the ODA staff. Well done, everybody. Cheers. It all worked. It's very nice <laughs> to know it does. Um, please stay in touch with the uh, Global Challenges series, hashtag Global Challenges. We had a really good start. I think this has been a good next one. There's more coming. And please stay on for lunch hosted by the ODI. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.